Thanks everyone for um, signing in to listen to our webinar again this week. Always appreciate your uh, attendance. We have a lineup of three speakers today um, and we're gonna cover a range of topics as we often do. So starting with um, our uh, attorney here in our Rochester office, Teresa Rusnak, talking about some recent um, guidance that was released by the EEOC. Then we're gonna move on to uh, Lance Willoughby Hudson down in our New York City office to talk about topic that none of us can get away from, which is AI. And then back to Rochester for Kurt Johnson, uh, talking about what you should do. A very practical topic today. What do you do when you get a subpoena? Very important. So um, I will just turn it right over to our first presenter of the day, Teresa Rosnack, a frequent contributor. I really appreciate that, Teresa. Um, so uh, go right ahead and tell us what uh, the latest news is from the EEOC. All right, thanks and good afternoon, everyone. Kathy, if I could have the first slide, please. So as Kristen mentioned, the EEOC has released proposed guidance. This is the first time since 2016 that they've proposed uh, adding to this topic. And the topic is harassment in the workplace. So on October 2nd, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission or the EEOC published proposed enforcement guidance on harassment in the workplace. I've included the web link for you there on the slide. Just copy and paste that or just Google EEOC proposed harassment guidance, it'll come right up for you. The proposed guidance is open for public comment for 30 days till, till November 1st, um, after which time the EEOC will look to finalize it and make it final binding guidance. As a reminder, the EEOC enforces workplace discrimination laws on a federal level. So that includes laws prohibiting work-related harassment based on sex, race, national origin, color, religion, disability, genetic information, and age. We have more protected categories than that in some different states, including New York. But when we're talking about the federal government and the EEOC in particular, those are the categories of harassment and protected categories that you cannot harass anyone on, nor can you be harassed on the basis of those protected categories. Next slide, please. One of the uh, interesting things that you'll notice pretty soon after reading the EEOC's new guidance is this renewed emphasis on gender identity. And for those of us in New York that have seen New York's uh, recently updated sexual harassment training and uh, model materials, you'll see that they have an emphasis on gender identity as well. On the federal government side, this is pretty expected. Uh, there was a, Bost a decision at the end of middle of 2020, rather, known as Bostock, which said that gender identity and sexual orientation are protected under Title VII because they are connected to sex. And so it's pretty expected that the EEOC and its newest guidance would focus on that um, because that decision was the first time that the federal government acknowledged that sexual orientation and gender identity are protected on a federal level under Title VII. So um, explicitly in this guidance, the EEOC includes that sexual harassment includes harassment on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity, including how that identity is expressed. So the way someone dresses, acts, talks, things of that nature, those are all gonna be considered protected under federal law. Uh, interestingly, the EEOC goes so far as to say intentional and repeated use of a name or pronoun inconsistent with the individual's gender identity, which is sometimes known as misgendering, is also going to be a type of harassment and discrimination, um, as well as denial of access to a bathroom consistent with one's own gender identity, uh, which the EEOC calls a discriminatory action in its own right. Uh, so for those of you that, you know, live and work in New York and have all of your employees in New York, uh, this shouldn't be uh, news to you. Uh, this has all been protected under New York law for some time. To the extent that you have employees in other locations, this is certainly something you're going to want to pay very close attention to. And even to the extent that you have employees in New York, now this is signaling that they can make complaints under federal law on these bases as well, not just under New York law, which I think is significant. Next slide, please. So another interesting thing, and these are just things that I pulled out, you know, I thought it was interesting that the EEOC put emphasis on medical conditions related to pregnancy. So we know that pregnancy is protected as a type of disability. It's known as a temporary disability under EEOC guidance. Um, but explicitly here, and really for the first time, the EEOC is saying conditions related to pregnancy include harassment based on lactation, contraceptive choices, and abortion. Um, they give several examples of these types of uh, 
uh, harassment as medical conditions related to pregnancy. Uh, so for example, harassing an employee because the employee chooses not to have an abortion, chooses to have an abortion, chooses to use contraceptives or not, are all actionable types of harassment under Title VII. Um, I think there's been some question for those of us that practice law if these things would go far enough to be viewed as harassment under Title VII, but according to the EEOC, they do. Next slide, please. There's a special mention of harassment and religious beliefs that's called out in this guidance that I thought was interesting to note because it's something I continue to see and because I do a lot of sexual harassment training, I continue to get this question quite frequently when I do trainings. And the basic question is, don't we have freedom of religion and don't we have to not discriminate or harass people based on their religious beliefs? And what happens when those religious beliefs come into conflict with some of the other equal employment opportunity protections? And so the EEOC has clarified here that while Title VII requires employers to accommodate sincerely held religious beliefs and practices, employers are not required to accommodate religious expression that creates or reasonably threatens to create a hostile work environment because employers also have a duty to protect workers against religiously motivated harassment. I tend to see this most commonly in the context of someone saying, I'm not going to use that person's pronouns or I'm not going to use that person's correct name because it goes against my religion. Um, and sometimes employers can admittedly get tripped up here because they know in America we have freedom of religion and we know under Title VII religious beliefs are a reason we can't be discriminated against in the workplace. Um, so there is tension there, but the EEOC has come down and said, for sure, someone's religious expression does not justify allowing a hostile work environment towards somebody else based on that person's protected category status. Next slide, please. Another interesting thing that I thought was, was of note is joint employers. If you would use a temporary staffing agency or if you have a joint employment relationship of any kind, I know from my own experience that sometimes it can be a little tricky to understand who's responsible for harassment complaints, investigating them and remedying them. The EEOC is very clear that the employer uh, on both sides of the joint employment relationship has the responsibility to prevent and correct harassment of temporary employees or joint employees, same as you would of permanent employees or sole employees of you only. Um, so you're not required to take duplicative corrective action, but each employer has an obligation to respond to potential harassment, either independently or in cooperation. So all that is to say, if you have temporary employees through a staffing agency or if you have another type of joint employment relationship and one of those folks makes a harassment complaint, you cannot just sit back and say, well, that person's not my employee. I don't have to do anything about it. Your obligation is much higher than that. And I thought it was interesting that the EEOC specifically called that out in this guidance. Next slide. And then finally, and this shouldn't be a surprise to anyone either, since COVID-19, we've seen an emphasis on uh, agencies showing that harassment can occur remotely or on off-duty forums or off-work platforms, especially electronic ones. So this guidance puts an emphasis on remote work conduct, such as conduct on emails, electronic bulletin boards, instant message, video conferencing, internet, et cetera, um, and says that those things are going to be considered harassment when they impact the workplace. And it gives the EEOC gives several examples, such as sexist comments made during a video meeting, racist image, imagery that's visible on an employee's workspace while participating in a video meeting, or sexual comments made during a video meeting um, about those types of, or of any kind. So uh, those are some of the things I called out. There's a lot more in that guidance. It is rather lengthy. I thought there were some interesting points about supervisory responsibilities, some points about associational discrimination, um, but I wanted to kind of hit the biggest highlights in our short time together today. And so with that, I will turn it back to Kristen. Thanks, Teresa. Uh, I will confess that I haven't had a chance to read the guidance myself yet. Um, did I see that it's um, something like 140 pages long? Is that right? Yeah, it's quite lengthy. And you might read it and think, oh, well, it's not actually all that long because a lot of it's footnotes. Uh, but spoiler alert for those interested, they actually put a lot of the guidance in the footnotes. So they annotate the footnotes and kind of give explanations of why they <laughs> why they, they did the footnotes. I don't know why they wrote it that way. I'm not responsible for those decisions. But if you are reading it and think you can stop at the footnotes, I urge you not to. There is significant <laughs> guidance in the footnotes as well. 
that's really good advice because it is often tempting to stop at the footnotes. It is tempting um, to stop there. So anyway, I appreciate given how long it is. I really appreciate you uh, breaking it down for us. And I, I will have to put that on my to-do list to, to read them all the way through. Um, so thank you so much. We're going to move on to our next presenter, um, who is Lance Willoughby Hudson. So Lance, welcome. I know that you've not presented uh, yet on our webinar. So we're so happy to have you today. Um, talking about art artificial intelligence, um, which is something that we hear about all the time, as I mentioned earlier. So um, go right ahead with your presentation. I'm looking forward to hearing it. Okay, hey, thank you, Kristen. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I just want to talk briefly about a, a settlement that was reached with the EEOC that regards artificial intelligence, better known as AI. Um, so as most of you may know, there's not really a lot of like regulation at the moment for AI, but in New York City, there was new regulation that was passed in July of this year that kind of regulates certain discriminatory practices that may occur in AI. But this is the first time, one of the first times that has been publicly noticed about a settlement with a federal agency. And just to kind of give you a little recap, um, I know the EEOC and the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission have issued like their intentions of just cracking down on AI within the next several years as AI is starting to grow more and more. So this is a really interesting settlement. So I'll just go right into it. So the EEOC sued iTutor Group in May 2022. And essentially, it was an issue where they relied on AI for their recruiting, an AI software platform that they use for recruiting applicants. So they found that the charging party, she applied using her real date and her credentials as a tutor to essentially apply for a tutor position with iTutor Group, which is a Chinese-based tutor services company in this English space. So she applied using her real information, and she realized that she was denied and she kind of just recognized it was kind of bizarre just for the simple fact that she had all these credentials, she's been teaching for a while. So they uncovered in this suit that they actually relied on AI software to discriminate against people or women over the age of 55 and also men over the age of 60. So they had the charging party reapply with a younger birth date and identical application materials, and she was offered an interview. So once this was discovered, they realized there was over 200 people who were affected by this AI software. So they filed the charge against iTutor Group, and essentially iTutor Group, they did not proclaim to actually do anything wrong, but they just went to the route of settlement. Next slide, please. So here are just an outline of some of the settlement terms, just to give you an idea of what could happen for other employers who use AI in a discriminatory way. So the big thing is that 365,000 was the penalty fee for all the rejected applicants who were denied a position or even just an interview with iTutor. And also, to this included back pay, liquid, liquidated damages for more than 200 applicants who were denied jobs. Also, too, iTutor was required to send out an invite to all those applicants who were denied wrongfully based on their age to reapply. And it was not all applicants, but just applicants during the time frame of March 2020 and April 2020. And also, too, um, the EEOC made it certain that each um, I tutor HR person made sure that each applicant was not discriminated against based on their sex going forward. And also too, um, I tutor is required to adapt anti-discrimination policies and conduct anti-discrimination trainings. And the biggest part about that is this is a process that the EEOC is going to monitor for the next five years. So that's pretty long that's a pretty long time just to basically have to report to the EEOC and just basically say exactly what all their practices are. Next slide, please. So here are some of the takeaways from this settlement. 
I think the one key thing is, and it's kind of common sense when you think about it, and I think most people do this anyway, but when it comes to the context of AI, it's a little different. So the first thing is just, just kind of do due diligence. You can use this AI software, but just make sure that it's using the data that's collected and making these guesses and make sure it's not discriminated against protected characteristics like sex, age, and et cetera. Um, some examples of the best way to do this is just look at characteristics as far as like job skills. Take these job skills and just compare it to what positions are available in the company and then kind of filter it out that way. And then it will not lead to like an AI discriminatory practice. Also, too, once AI delivered the results, even though you do your due diligence, make sure you go through all the results of all the AI information that's produced and just make sure there's no large group of people who may be discriminated against. Like you don't want a lot of people who are over the age of 55 who were eliminated or a lot of women were eliminated for certain positions. So just really just checking through all that data that's collected through the AI software and just ensuring that it's actually correct and not against the law. And the other thing to keep in mind too is just to continue to monitor what the EEOC does over the next few years. You wanna just make sure that you study all the cases and what's going out there and just check with local laws and just state laws because as you all know, this is still like a, a new thing. So it's just constantly changing. So just stand on top of that and just making sure you're covering all bases and doing your due diligence will help out a lot with pre preventing having a settlement like this and having this large amount. And I'll hand it back over to Kristen. Okay. All right. Thanks so much for that um, summary of that settlement. Um, I think we'll be seeing more of that. So uh, good to know uh, what's going on out there. So taking us away from the EEOC theme, which was unintentional. I actually didn't really realize it until <laughs> Lance started speaking like, oh, wait, I put two EEOC topics back to back. What a coincidence. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, moving right along here. Uh, Kurt, uh, and I apologize, I'm just noticing that your name is spelled slightly wrong on this slide, but I greatly apologize, we will fix that. Um, appreciate you being here to talk about what happens when you are, um, you receive the subpoena. It happens in lots of contexts. So um, you part, as part of our litigation department, something that uh, I'm sure you advise clients on a lot. So uh, looking forward to hearing about it. Right. Thanks, Kristen. So first of all, i um, not going to start with assuming everyone knows what a subpoena is. So quickly, a subpoena is uh, a document that's served typically with via a process server on a person or company that's not party to a piece of litigation, compelling that person's attendance or their production of documents or information. A lot of times when you get a subpoena, it'll say, even if it's asking for documents, it'll ask you to appear at a certain date and time. What it really means is we want the documents by that date and time. Um, if it says that they're requesting your testimony, then it's a testimonial subpoena. Subpoenas can be issued by uh, an attorney whose client is party to the litigation. They can also be issued by a court. Um, we see that often when one party is representing itself or in family court, there are certain rules that require the court to be the only party to issue subpoenas. And um, as a bit of a flashing red light. They can also be issued by the attorney general um, and other governmental bodies as part of an investigation. And if you get one of those subpoenas, um, that should be uh, quite a, an alert to you. Um, so there's, like I said, different types of subpoenas. There's discovery subpoena, subpoenas. That the purpose of those is to learn facts that are not in the parties to the litigation's knowledge um, or to either that or to confirm facts that are already stated by a party in, in litigation. Um, and there's two types of discovery subpoenas. There's subpoenas for books and records, and there's subpoenas for deposition testimony. Um, the books and records subpoenas just require you to provide copies of your documents. Uh, and obviously testimony is when you have to show up for a deposition and be questioned under oath. Um, you can also receive a trial subpoena. So if you need a witness to appear at a trial and you want to confirm that they're actually going to be there, you need to subpoena them. So you may be subpoenaed or some of your employees may be subpoenaed to show up at a trial. And then, as I mentioned, the attorney, the attorney general and other uh, governmental agencies can conduct investigations via subpoenas, both by asking for books and records and by asking for your deposition testimony. And notably there, there does not have to be pending litigation. They did, the attorney general does not have to first sue you. They can conduct a bunch of a bunch of discovery and then use that discovery to draft their complaint against you, which can be frustrating. Um, and finally, there's another type of subpoena called an information subpoena. You see that often 
when a person already has a judgment against them and the requesting party wants to learn about that person's assets. They're often sent to banks. Um, and you typically respond to those by answering the questions in written format and returning it. Um, what are the steps for responding to a subpoena? Well, the first step, and probably the only one you really need to remember as your takeaway today is call your attorney uh, and call them immediately. Don't let that sit on your desk for a few weeks and then call them because your, your attorney's ability to help you respond is going to be limited a little bit by how much time they have. Um, so what is your attorney going to do when you get a subpoena? The first thing you're going to do is confirm that the subpoena was properly served. If it wasn't properly served, you don't need to respond to it. It should come with a check, a witness fee. And if you're going to respond to the subpoena and you don't plan on fighting it, it's okay to cash that check. I get that question a lot from clients. I got this check. It's for like 15 bucks. What do I do with it? It's yours. You can, you can have that money. Um, but I've also seen subpoenas and I've also helped get subpoenas quashed where service was improper. We had a client who was the chairman of a, of a publicly traded company's board and he lived in Singapore. And his company's headquarters were here in Rochester where I live. And they tried to serve him by serving the company's headquarters. And we were able to confirm that that was improper because it was not his place of work. He always worked out of Singapore, never came to Rochester and it's not where he resided. So the service was improper. Um, and ultimately the court did not make us comply with that subpoena, which was good because it really impacted the, the litigation. Um, you also want to, uh, your attorney is going to look at whether or not the subpoena um, triggers something like your attorney client privilege. If you're being asked for privileged information, certainly you don't want to provide that. If you turn it over, you're waiving privilege. So you need to make sure you have an attorney to help you assert privilege. Um, the, th the first thing after confirming that service is proper that your attorney is going to do is they're going to call the party who issued the subpoena. They're going to call the lawyer on the other side and they're going to negotiate the subpoena. Just because you've got a document saying, please produce X or please show up at deposition on X date doesn't mean you necessarily have to do that exactly as written in the subpoena. If it's a trial subpoena, there's going to be a little less negotiation. But if it's a discovery subpoena, which are more common, there's negotiating. So we can get you an extension of your time to respond. Sometimes we can get you extra months to respond. Um, so if something is looking for a lot of information and you're worried about it, get extra time. The, the requesting party is going to be happy to give it to you unless they're under a serious time crunch. And the court is going to give it to you if it got to that stage of a court review of the subpoena. You can also try to limit the scope of the subpoena. Let's say you get a request for, you know, what would amount to gigabytes worth of documents. Um, and you don't want to have to go and find all those documents and search and review them. You really want to drill down to the, the nitty gritty, the facts, the things that the requesting party really needs. Because a lot of times they'll ask for everything under the sun, even if they don't really need it, just to be thorough. Um, so your attorney can negotiate the scope of the subpoena. Um, sometimes if the subpoena identifies a specific witness, like your CEO, that they want to appear, often that witness isn't really the person that they want to uh, depose, um, because the CEO, understandably, isn't going to be knowledgeable about a lot of the day-to-day -day things that the person asking the questions is going to really care about. Um, and often a lower level employee is going to be more knowledgeable or appropriate. And our CEOs are busy. We don't want to trouble them. That being said, we want to put forth an employee who's going to well represent the company um, and, and be well spoken and do a good job. And your attorney can help you identify that person and assess potential witnesses who may be testifying and say, hey, look, this person, they're knowledgeable, but they're just not a great witness. Maybe we can find somebody else. We have a good sense of that. Um, we can seek to have a subpoena withdrawn. We can call the opposing counsel and say, look, our company doesn't actually have the information you're looking for, or, you know, maybe you need to try to get that information from your opposing party first, because that's your requirement. You can't just go subpoena information from third parties and trouble them with your litigation if some one of the parties to the litigation has that information. So those are arguments we'll make when you get that subpoena is, hey, go look somewhere else first, or we don't have anything for you. Um and ultimately, and especially in New York State, when you're subpoenaed, we can demand that the cost of responding to your subpoena be defrayed by the party issuing it. So as you quite imagine, um, when you get a subpoena and your attorneys have to do a bunch of work, they're going to bill you for that work. Well, it's fair game to ask the party issuing the subpoena to pay for that work, especially if it involves advising you on what documents you need to look for and reviewing those documents for privilege and relevance before they go out the door. Um, we often ask for those expenses 
um, to be defrayed. And sometimes we even ask for them up front. And the reason we do that is we maybe are a little skeptical about the party requesting the information and their ability to pay. You know, if it's a, an individual in a uh, personal injury action or an individual that doesn't seem to have a lot of resources, we may ask for them to pay up front. And often that request to pay is going to result in the scope of the subpoena being reduced. So you don't actually have to look at as many documents because they don't want to pay for you to look at as many documents. Um, we can also negotiate confidentiality. If there's not a confidentiality order already in that in the case where the subpoena was issued, you want to try to put one in place if they're asking for anything that would involve protected information like account information or any other uh, information that you would have to protect uh, based on cybersecurity. Um, and also if there's, you know, trade secrets or any integral business information that they're seeking. Um, so protective orders can pr provide uh, protection from having that information produced publicly. And there's another level of protection called attorney's eyes only that will only allow the opposing parties or the parties to litigation's attorneys to review the documents, not the parties themselves. So they can't learn your trade secrets. Uh, um, so those are things that we can negotiate on your behalf. If you get a subpoena and you wanna to object to it, you wanna say, I'm not gonna to respond to this in full, uh, there's timelines to do that. So um, first in uh, state court, you have 20 days to respond to a subpoena and those 20 days are your time to file objections. In federal court, compliance is really just what's reasonable. Um, there's no limit upper or lower on how long the, out from when they serve you with the subpoena you have to respond, but you have to file your objections within 14 days. Um, and objections ultimately, at least in federal court, Put the burden on the subpoenaing party to move to compel your compliance with the subpoena. So if you issue a bunch of objections and say, I shouldn't have to give you this, it's creating an undue burden, it's got it's, they're asking for trade secrets, they're asking for privilege, then the party that issued the subpoena has to run to the court where they subpoenaed you and try to get you to comply. And then you have an opportunity to respond to that motion and explain to the judge why you shouldn't have to comply. Um, you can also affirmatively move to quash the subpoena. So you can go to the court, uh, your local court, um, if you're out of, if, if you're being subpoenaed for something that's not, you're not in the jurisdiction where the case is pending, or you go where the case is pending, and you make a motion telling that telling the judge, look, there's something wrong with the subpoena. Um, either they didn't serve it right, or outside of the geographic limits of the subpoena power of this court, um, they didn't give us reasonable amount of time to comply. There's privilege issues. It's an undue burden to respond. Um, they're seeking trade secrets. Um, they're asking for an expert opinion. They can't just subpoena you for your expert opinion and if you weren't retained as an expert. Um, and the court can order reasonable compensation for the subpoenaed party. That's in federal and state court. So we talked about defraying costs being in the statute statewide. Um, in federal court, we have uh, options to try to get some of those costs defrayed as well. Uh, so then when, what do we do when we respond to a subpoena? So the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna work with your lawyer to identify where documents might be within your electronic system, within your paper system. Um, and that lawyer is going to collect those documents from you and then review them and determine whether or not they're actually responsive to what the what's called for in the subpoena. Make sure there's not privilege, make sure there's not confidential, confidential information, and then ultimately approve or disapprove of you sending that out the door. Um, and as we said, that those costs shouldn't be borne by you, they should be borne by the party asking for that information. Um, if a source of information is electronically stored and it's inaccessible, we can help you know, smooth that over. We can say, look, this is something that's on a backup tape that we created 15 years ago, don't even have the software to recreate it, and probably you won't have to produce that. Um, Ultimately, if we assert privilege, we may need to create what's called a privilege log that lists each document that we're withholding and the reason we're withholding it. Um, the other part of a subpoena, a subpoena for your deposition testimony or your trial testimony, um, your attorney will meet with whoever you've designated as the witness, either if there's a specific witness identified in the subpoena or if they're subpoenaing your company generally and you're picking the witness, um, we'll meet with them and we'll prepare them just like we would prepare them if they were a party to the litigation. Because even though you're not a party to the litigation, you don't have skin in the game, you don't care maybe who wins and loses that particular piece of litigation, there's still a lot of potential hazards that can come up when you're testifying. 
You could inadvertently say something that paints a target on your company's back or say something that could hurt you down the road. And so we'll help prepare a witness. We'll also make sure that, you know, witnesses are usually nervous about testifying. We'll help them get comfortable with the process. We'll help them understand how to answer basic questions. Um, we may do practice questioning with them. So they're really comfortable when, they, when they're when they at their, their deposition. And we'll sit with them at the deposition and defend them and assert objections, protect privilege, stuff like that. Um, if you get attorney general subpoena, like I said, that should be a flashing red light. You need to find out if your company is the target of an investigation. Sometimes the attorney general will send subpoenas to a lot of parties, uh, even the ones they're not targeting, particularly in the construction industry. You'll see them, you know, subpoenaing parties that did business with their target um, and trying to find out if there was, you know, falsification of business records or something by the target. And they'll use your records to verify that. But sometimes your client is, you know, you are the target of that investigation. And if that's the case, you want to know because you want to start thinking about what the response is to that eventual enforcement action by the attorney general or other government agency. Um, and you want to consider what you should and should not be complying with with respect to the attorney general's request. Now, what are the penalties if you don't comply? If you get this subpoena, you wrinkle it up and you file it in that circular file that we all love to place things in, uh, what happens? Well, the first thing that's going to happen is that someone who's issued the, the subpoena is most likely going to make a motion to compel your testimony or your production of documents. And that at that stage, you're not really in a lot of trouble if you haven't responded, but you're going to be made by a court to, to do what the subpoena said. Um, now, the subpoena will have language on it saying if you don't respond, you're in contempt. They could skip the stage of a motion to compel and they could bring consent proceedings. But if you show up to the consent proceedings and you respond with documents or agree to testify, most likely that'll be the end of it. The purpose of the contempt proceeding is really to coerce your compliance. Um, and so if you ultimately comply, there's a potential for a fine, um, but it's it's potentially, you know, just comply and you'll be fine. Um, so not advising anyone to ignore a subpoena or be in contempt. But if you find yourself in that position, we can help you with that. Um, ultimately, if you're an individual uh, and you don't respond to a subpoena, you could be arrested um, as part of the contempt proceeding, I've actually done that where we've had judgment debtors who didn't respond. We had the sheriff pick them up, um, the civil bureau, and I'll sit them sit them down at the uh, sheriff's office and ask all the questions that they should have responded to in an information subpoena, for example. Um, and, and that's certainly not a fun thing to have happen, um, but some people just don't want to deal with their, their judgments and their problems, and you got to deal with it. Um, so again, if you have any questions about getting a subpoena, if you get a subpoena, call your lawyer. And if you're worried about what it's going to cost you internally, this is the one time I can say, normally we talk about burden shifting and cost shifting as non-existent in the U.S. because we have the American rule, parties to litigation pay their own way. Uh, when you're subpoenaed and you're not a party to the litigation, that's the one time that by statute and by case law, you're going to find yourself in a situation where you can ask the parties to defray your reasonable attorney's fees. Um, so I'm not going to say it's not going to cost you anything, but the cost should be limited and should be uh, recoverable if uh, the subpoena ultimately moves forward and you have to comply with it. Great. Kristen? Thank you. That was great. Um, really, really uh, practical. I think I used that word too many times today, but that's, that's how I view it. Um, and, you know, I want to throw one thing in there um, for Kurt. Uh, I spent a few years in-house um, recently. In my experience, in-house was one of the challenges is making sure not only you know all these things about how important it is to respond to subpoena, but people in your organization, because sometimes they get sent to corners of an organization that don't know what to do with a legal document. And um, so maybe thinking about, you know, making sure those that are most likely to be on the receiving end of that piece of paper know what to do with it <laughs> and then, uh, you know, can respond appropriately. Um, yeah, that's a really good point. You know, certainly uh, some sort of one liner in a training, an annual training might be a, a good idea. Yep. Um, great. So thank you for that. Um, that about wraps things up for today. We're, at, we're ending a little early. Um, I'm sure no one's complaining about that. Um, just another quick plug for our breakfast briefing about um, managing the struggling employee. We still have a few cities left. Uh, on this and uh, 
the feedback we get con it continues to be very positive. It's a very interactive session. Still time to sign up. It's also National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Um, and I know that uh, keep your eye out. If you're not already on Bond's mailing list in terms of cybersecurity issues, we have a really top-notch uh, practice group that sends out a lot of really in, um, very useful, very uh, cutting edge um, updates on what's going on in that world. So encourage you to um, follow along that contact us if you wanna be on that mailing list, certainly something we all need to be paying attention to. So that is all we have today. Thank you. Here are our speaker contact information uh, slide in case you wanna reach out with any follow-up questions and um, fill out the survey if you can. And uh, we will see you again here um, next week. Take care.